Okay, we're going to get started. <laughs> My name is Christopher. My name is Christopher Merrill, and as the director of the International Writing Program, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight to the last lecture in this year-long series titled Creative Matters, which is sponsored by the Office of Vice President for Research, and which I am pleased to report will continue next year. I wish to begin by singling out for special thanks Dan Reed, whose support for the arts and humanities is crucial to the life of our community. Creative Matters, which brings together artists, writers, and thinkers to discuss the creative process, grows out of the Arts Advancement Committee convened by Provost Barry Butler and Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, Chadan Jalali. Co-chaired by Alan McVeigh and Chuck Swanson, our charge was to synthesize energies, forge connections across disciplines, and spark new ideas in conjunction with the rebuilding of our arts campus. Exhibit A is Creative Matters, the brainchild of David Gere, George de la Pena, Ann Ricketts, and Leslie Weatherhead, to whom I owe a debt of gratitude for dreaming up and coordinating this wonderful series of events. Creativity is a defining feature of the University of Iowa, the first higher educational institution in this country to award graduate credit for creative work and to broaden our understanding of the mysterious means by which new discoveries are made in the arts, humanities, and sciences, we have often invoked the creative process, reflections on invention in the arts and sciences, a book of essays and reflections on the ways in which artists, writers, composers, and mathematicians, and scientists have made discoveries integral to our fabric of life. In the introduction, the poet Brewster Gieselin argues that invention in the arts and, and in thought is a part of the invention of life. Creative Matters seeks to foster such invention because it is critical to our aesthetic, physical, and spiritual survival. So then, a quick review of where our explorations have taken us this year. William Bro Adams, chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities, kicked off the series with a lecture titled Creativity and the Common Good, which reminded us of the inherent value of artistic production, a fact that Sunil Iyengar, director of research and analysis at the National Endowment for the Arts, translated into economic terms for our second lecture in the series. Then David Lang, a UI alumnus and Pulitzer Prize winning composer, vividly described his compositional process, concluding with a performance by an ensemble from the Center for New Music. His theme was the secret power of music for good and evil, a theme that preoccupied our next writer, Edgar Carrot, the acclaimed short story Israeli writer, who read from his memoir, The Seven Good Years and then discussed the fabulous turns that a fiction can take in the alchemical process of writing. The Dutch artist Theo Janssen delighted us in November with a lecture on his kinetic sculptures, Strande Beast, The Dream Machines, and in December, our own Marilyn Robinson challenged us to reimagine Emerson's notion of the American scholar for higher education in the 21st century. Margaret Wertheim's lecture, The Poetic Enchantments of Science, inspired us to see the world anew from the various vantage points of the artist, the mathematician, and the ecologist. In short, we have traveled far and deep, and I'm certain that tonight's lecture will spur, spur yet more new thinking. Sarah Lewis's book, The Rise, Creativity, The Gift of Failure, and the Search for Memory, Mystery, a Los Angeles Times bestseller, was hailed by a who's who of creative thinkers. Lewis Hyde called it a welcome departure from standard accounts of artistry and innovation. Like Mal Malcolm Gladwell, Edwidge Danticott wrote, Lewis brilliantly takes complex ideas and makes them easy to follow, making it possible for us to see the world in a brand new way. And from the New York Times, Lewis's voice is so lyrical and engaging that her book, The Rise, can be read in one sitting, which is so much the better since its argument is multi-layered and needs to be taken whole. 
The book will be available for purchase after the event, and Professor Lewis has kindly offered to sign copies. She received her BA from Harvard, an MPhil from Oxford, and a PhD from Yale. She appears on Oprah's power list. She told me today that she had to fly to LA and back within 48 hours as a part of that, and served on President Obama's Arts Policy Committee. She is currently a professor in the history of art and architecture and African and African American studies departments at Harvard University, having previously held positions at Yale's School of Art, the Tate Modern, and the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Her second book will be published by Harvard University Press in 2016, and her TED Talk, Embrace the Near Win, has been viewed by over 90,000 people. I came to know Sarah first through her contribution to Trust Me, I'm an Expert, talking culture inside and out. Not long after, when I was traveling in some godforsaken place, she sent me an intriguing email. Would I like to talk to her about failure? I replied that I had been waiting all my life to discuss just that. <laughs> Fail again, as Samuel Beckett wrote, fail better. Little did I know what an amazing book she would make out of her interviews with more than 150 people from all walks of creative life. And, to, and if to see her here tonight at the University of Iowa closes a certain circle for me, I hope that it also opens many more paths for every single one of us. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Lewis to the University of Iowa. <laughs> Good evening. Can everyone hear me? I think the mic is on now. Good evening. Louder, please. How is that? Yes? How about we adjust before we begin? I'm going to be my own flight attendant before departure. Better? Yes? No? No? Uh oh. What can we do, A.B.? Sounds good from where I'm standing. If not, uh, is that good? OK, great. I can't come all the way here and not, not be heard and have a conversation with you. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Do you want to adjust anything? There, there's no controls for the audio in this room, but this room is a little louder. Oh, I see. This would be a fallback if that is too quiet. Aha, uh -huh. OK. We have a safety net. All right. Well, Chris, thank you so much for that warm introduction. It, for me, uh, made me feel just very full. You know, I came to find Christopher Merrill's uh, books and a few interviews, and I decided to reach out to him about a, a topic, failure and creativity, when I was writing The Rise. And as you can imagine, you get a lot of doors slammed or sort of emails unreturned when you write to people asking to speak about failure in the creative process. And I was so thrilled to not only have him write back to me, but to embark upon a conversation that lasted maybe an hour, an hour and a half, that resulted in some of the most uh, meaningful, nourishing ideas uh, for the book itself. At the time, I was doing something ill-advised for the students in the room. I was writing my dissertation alongside writing a book, which means that this is actually the first time that I've given a talk about the book at the other end of that process, now as a professor. So it's meaningful to come to the University of Iowa after this process to celebrate uh, the book. As part of the Creative Matters series, for the last 18 months or so, when I was asked to speak about the rise, I'd largely focus on the role and the gift of failure for creating iconic works of art. I would look at the different themes that my book, this atlas of stories of artists and entrepreneurs and innovators, looking at how these stories have told us what different thematics people have used and employed to benefit from these gifts of failure. But I decided for this talk that I would instead really pose a question both to myself and to all of you about why creativity is so important. The title of the series, Creative, Create, Creative Matters, really poses this question to all of its speakers. Why does it matter? 
The description of the lecture series reminds us of the fact that it does. It states creativity is not only at the core of all research and discovery, but also central to our human experience. So why is that true? Is it just to honor individual expression? That's certainly one answer. But lately, what's animated my work is thinking through an answer that's more capacious. I think art is one of the few technologies that we have that allows us to shift intractable perceptions about those who we consider to be unlike ourselves. It seemed time to speak about this, given many of our current events, and to do so in the context of the book that I wrote in Creativity at Large. So I want to talk today about the role of art, not just for our own creative lives, but for global citizenship. Ultimately, what I'm really talking about is the role of art for justice. Now, over the course of the next 30 minutes, and we'll open up for questions, I'm going to speak about this idea really as it relates to two themes. The way in which the arts can give us a sense of immersive concentration, sort of sustained attention to difficult societal failures, you might say, and also can offer a bridge to connect us to those unlike ourselves. I started to think about this idea when I began to write The Rise. There's a short sentence in the book about my grandfather whose initials I bear, his name is much cooler than mine, his name is Shadrach Emanuel Lee. It's pretty good, right? Sarah Elizabeth Lewis, a little bit more, stayed. My grandfather was the freest person in my family. But he had a seriousness of purpose and focus that always compelled me to understand him a little bit more. This kind of duality intrigued me. I found out early in my life that my grandfather in 1926 was expelled from the 11th grade in a New York City public school for asking where African Americans were in the history books. The teacher told him that African Americans had done nothing to merit inclusion and he refused to take this answer as fact, and he was expelled for his so-called impertinence. His pride was so wounded, in fact, that he never went back to high school after being expelled. And instead, he went on to become a jazz musician and a painter, inserting images of African Americans into the genre scenes in which he knew we did, in fact, exist. What I learned from my grandfather is that the endeavor to affirm the dignity of human life cannot be waged without pictures, without the arts, without, you might say, representational justice. This he knew. American citizenship has long been a project of vision and justice, and understanding this relationship for the quest for full citizenship has required an advanced state of visual literacy particularly during times of turmoil. Now, to just cut right to the chase, today we've been able to witness injustices firsthand on a massive scale in ways that would have been unimaginable decades ago, let alone in 1926. We've had to ask ourselves questions that call upon powers of visual analysis to read, for example, the image of Eric Gardner's killing in New York, virally disseminated through social media, or to understand the symbolism in Dylan Roof's self-styled portraiture before his killing of the Emanuel Nine in Charleston. Being an engaged citizen requires grappling with pictures and knowing their historical context, at times with near art historical precision. Yet it is the artist who knows what images need to be seen to affect change and alter history, to shine a spotlight in ways that will result in sustained attention. Now this is not a new idea, the role of art for citizenship and justice. It really goes back to the Civil War. There's a chapter in my book entitled Beauty, Error, and Justice that really offers a bridge from that book to the current one that's really focused on this idea. It centers on the work of Frederick Douglass, this abolitionist and great 19th century thinker, who understood this long ago 
1861, he gave a speech in Boston's Tremont Temple, that integrated church one block from Boston Commons, and argued that combat might end complete sectional disunion, but that America's vision of itself and reconciliation after the Civil War would require something unexpected, even overlooked. We'll never know how he said it, but we do know that the audience was largely silent as he focused on the critical role of what some might consider just irrelevant in the face of war and nation-severing conflict. Pictures and the images they would conjure in the imagination. In this Civil War speech entitled Pictures and Progress, Douglas spoke about the transformative power of images to affect a new vision of the nation. The most photographed American man in the 19th century, as my colleague John Stauffer argues, Douglas said that combat might end this sectional disunion, but America would require pictures because of the images they inspire in the imagination. In this understudied speech, Douglas fervently made the case that, quote, the key to the great mystery of life and progress was the ability of men and women to fashion a mental picture in his or her mind and let his or her entire world sentiments and vision of every other living thing be affected by it. Douglas went on to describe the whole soul of man as a sort of picture gallery, a grand panorama. He said that this inward picture-making faculty, as he put it, this human capacity for artful imaginative thought is what permits us to quote, to see quote, the picture of life contrasted with the fact of life, the ideal contrasted with the real. In other words, an encounter with images that move us has a double-barreled force to convey humanity as it is and through the imagination to ignite an inner vision of life as it could be. All that is really peculiar to humanity, Douglas said, proceeds from this one faculty or power. From the orator and abolitionist came one of the earliest articulations of how the private function of what I call aesthetic force operates in public life. Perhaps the most surprising thing about this speech might not be that Douglas said it, but when he did, at a time of unthinkable retrenchment and national fracture, when there was blood on the fields. He even began his speech with an apology, saying that, quote, it might seem almost an impertinence to ask your attention to a lecture on pictures. Yet he would continue, despite the confusion of his audience, expecting to hear a lecture about the Civil War and its union slashing effects. But they listened, for Douglas was, quote, one of the most meritorious men, if not the most meritorious man in the United States, as President Abraham Lincoln put it. Douglas told his story through autobiographies that garnered him wide acclaim. My Bondage and My Freedom from 1855 that sold 5,000 copies in the first two days of its publication and a book that resulted in a warrant for his life. As we know, he fled to Britain to escape capture and return to slavery. John Whittier was not alone in considering Douglas's work the headwaters of a, quote, new, truly national literature. Yet Douglas also knew that the key to change would lie in our literature of pictures. So confused as they were, they listened, for it came from this, quote, volcanic, near peerless orator. At a time when orators were analogous to star athletes and the stage could resemble a boxing ring, his will, skill, and style had proved to nearly all that, as one journalist put it, quote, this is an extraordinary man, a man cut out for a hero. As a speaker, he has few equals. In his study, Frederick Douglass would redraft this speech three different times over the course of his life, developing the ideas over a 30-year period. He was part of a set of thinkers such as Oliver Wendell Holmes, who engaged in this intersection of image-making and worldview in the Civil War and postbellum period. Now, Douglass was asking the conceptual questions we still pose today in the field of art history Specifically, not only what does it mean to grapple with material and pictures at a time of crisis, but what are the ways in which images have not only codified but ruptured our conceptions of race and citizenship? In other words, Douglas was describing at once an artistic problem and one with sweeping implications for the international scope of race and American citizenship. 
Now today, we're saturated with images. We now live in a world where the power of an image is so self-evident, so common that it's easily dismissed. Douglas was writing at a time when this power could not be easily forgotten. As I wrote in The Rise, it, as I see it, was a modernist vision at the dawn of the age of photography that might take decades, if not a century or more, to be made clear. But just think of it. How many movements began when an aesthetic encounter indelibly changed our past perceptions of the world? It was an abolitionist print that I'm showing you here, the description of a slave ship from 1789, not logical argument alone that dealt the final blow to the legalization of the slave trade. This London print of the British slave ship Brooks, which shows with dehumanizing statistical visualization and graphic precision how the legally permitted 454 men, women, and children could be accommodated when in fact the slave ship Brooks carried more like 740. The image it conjured in the mind was intolerable enough to help abolish the institution. The broadside served in parliamentary hearings as the evidentiary proof of slavery's inhumanity. How many went to Selma because they were moved by the images of injustice on their television? How many, like Brown versus Board of Education constitutional lawyer Charles Black Jr. saw that segregation was wrong after being moved by the power of an artist. In this case, the genius of the trumpet player, Louis Armstrong. Armstrong's genius, Black would state when he went to see him one night in 1939 in Austin, Texas, not expecting to do anything other than meet some girls at a college dance, he said, opened my eyes wide and put to me a choice, to keep to a small view of humanity or to embrace a more expanded vision. He saw genius in Louis Armstrong. He understood the genius coming out of his horn, and he knew that segregation must be wrong if it was coming out of the body of an African-American man. Charles Black describes what aesthetic force can do. It can create a clear line forward and an alternate route to choose. Later, Black would say that in many ways, this was the day that he began walking towards the Brown versus Board of Education case. Brown. Black never forgot it. He held an annual Armstrong listening night at Columbia University and Yale University, where he would go on to teach constitutional law, to honor the power of art in the field of justice and the man who caused him to have an inner life-changing shift. Douglas was making a case for the epiphanic power of an image to shift our vision of the world. He was making a case for the power of art to arrest us, to penetrate us, to stop us in our tracks. He was reminding us that art is a technology, a way to access interiority, kind of a sustained attention that I love Thomas Jefferson sort of exemplified here when he describes in this letter how a painting fixed him like a statue a quarter of an hour or half an hour. I do not know which, for I lost all ideas of time, even the consciousness of my own existence. My colleague at Harvard, Jennifer Roberts, has underscored the role of the arts in allowing for this sense of immersive concentration or private domains, as I describe them in, in my book, The Rise, by asking her students to spend three hours looking at one object, which she calls a painfully long period of time. <laughs> she asks them to jot down observations and document where this exercise lets the mind go. I mention all this to remind us that immersive concentration, the kind that only the arts can provide, was once at the nexus point of vision and justice. I mention all this also because I wonder, when are we able to give our sustained attention to issues of injustice now? Technology has allowed us to scale the reach of images, disseminating them more broadly and more quickly than ever before. But if there is such thing as aesthetic force, such that we're moved tremendously by a work of art enough to see the world differently, when does scale through technology help? I've begun to wonder if perhaps the glut of images has given rise to a kind of bystander effect. Maybe some of you are wondering the same. 
Psychologists coined this term, the bystander effect, in 1964 after a murder in New York City in Kew Gardens, Queens, when a young woman, 28 years old, was walking a little after three in the morning to her home and was stabbed by a man in the street. People saw the incident, and for 35 minutes, no one called the police to help. Now, the initial reporting of this murder of Catherine Kitty Genovese was inflated. The report stated that 35 men and women saw the murder, when in fact that was a larger number than those who in fact did. But the attention that the story received resulted in the final push to create the 911 hotline and spurred psychologists to study the impact of crowds on our actions. The presence of the crowd gives us a sense that someone else, somewhere, must be doing something. What are the effects of looking at images again and again of injustice on our social platforms? What are the costs and what does it require of us as viewers? Has the dissemination of images of injustice created a similar bystander effect, a desensitizing phenomenon? I think of this often as I wonder what more I might have done if I had not known that there were millions of others expressing outrage over incidents in, in Baltimore or New York. Was Douglas's idea merely relevant to his time, or is it still applied to today? I see this as critical to understand because, because culturally we remain connected to each other through media, through pictures, streaming videos, the live stream that's going out to people right now. Yet a recent study on the impact of video footage and judicial decisions reminds us that, in fact, the hypervisibility of images increases our polarization instead of offering additional evidence to support a certain case. That is to say, video footage does not seem to reduce bias in court cases. Instead, these videos, these images, increase our sense of veracity in our own judgments. So what I've come to understand is that there is a doubleness to the work that I study, to pictures, to a work of art. There's a doubleness because of the way in which it exists as material and works on the page, and because of how it exists within us. The way in which we're living out this doubleness allowed me to understand why Douglas was so committed to this idea, why he redrafted his speech countless times, and why at the end he mused nearly on the page and aloud to his audiences about the need for someone, he said, over a century later to perhaps revisit the theme. It's crucial to understand now, I think, because we live in an increasingly polarized climate in the United States. Sociologists tell us that people now congregate and live, worship and play and learn with those like themselves more than ever before. Save for constructed societies, we come into close contact with those who we do not share our political and religious views with less and less. How we remain connected increasingly depends on the function of the arts increasingly the way we process worlds unlike our own. The tool we marshal to cross the gulf between us, in other words, is irrevocably altered vision. The imagination, as Douglas said, inspired by aesthetic encounters can get us to a point of benevolent surrender, making a way for a new version of our collective selves. As a professor of art history and African American studies and at Harvard, I often think about this nexus of vision and justice, but increasingly I see that visual literacy is our collective work. Recently, Aperture Magazine asked me to guest edit an issue for their journal dedicated to photography, and I chose this theme. Today, in fact, oh, can we stop it from, oh, <laughs> there we go. Today, in fact, we released these two covers. This is a Richard Avedon image of Martin Luther King with his father and son. And Aperture was kind enough to allow us to have two covers. The image on the left oh, I don't know, is by Awal Arezku, a young Ethiopian photographer who was a student of mine, in fact, at Yale's MFA program. In the editor's note, I write about how we often see this nexus of vision and justice as just a retrospective exercise, a, a way to chronicle the past. We saw this most notably with what I would call Martin Luther King's aesthetic funerals. 
The urge after his death to visually unfurl images and ideas and epic visions about American culture as if to secure a horizon line that felt suddenly in doubt. We saw these aesthetic funerals embodied in this Benedict Fernandez photograph taken on April 5, 1968, of three young boys with their torsos covered in buttons of King's Poor People's Campaign, as if they were laying out the body of King across their own. At the time of year when Fernandez took this photograph, the Metropolitan Museum of Art was planning an exhibition called Harlem on My Mind to open in 1969, which used the visual poetics of unfurling, a spread of the archive, to show the development of Harlem. The show was designed as a tour, a processional through these chronologically ordered galleries, but it had an unusual feature, a closed circuit television that showed exhibition visitors at the Met, footage of pedestrians walking on 125th Street in Harlem. This now nearly unimaginable feature of a camera displaying a neighborhood as if it's a distant culture from that of the Upper East Side still offers a vivid reminder that art is the way that we cross the gulf that separates us. Now, Douglas, as I mentioned, had no doubt that the scope of his ideas about thought pictures would need further explanation. The influence of pictures, he said, upon our thoughts may someday furnish a theme for those better able than I to do it justice. It has since become a timeless idea, articulated by national leaders and sages in our age. Taking you through a bit of the issue, the Aperture Magazine issue. Just a little bit of a preview to get us. To Douglas. I visited his estate on a hill in Anacostia and lingered in his study that was angled to face three things at once. That glass paneled bookshelf, a wall of pictures and photographs, and a window with a view of pure expanse. Behind his home was a windowless one-room brick house that he had built to replicate the slave cabin where he was born. From his front lawn, he could face the arc of his own life. To the right, the green expanse of Maryland where he was born, enslaved, and to the left, Washington, where he began, became a man so prominent that a bill was introduced in the Senate for his body to be lain in the state in the Capitol upon his death. By way of conclusion, I would say now what I recalled wondering then, how do we address this epiphenomenon that extends pictures of our lives to the kind of inner images that Douglas would have us consider? How do we handle the scale that technology has offered us to make us both awash with them and perhaps desensitized to them? What we lose if we underestimate the power of the arts, the power of an aesthetic act, is not solely talent and freedom of expression, as important as that is, but we lose the avenue to see up and out of collective failures that we didn't even know we had. Douglas reminds us that this is not simply a luxury aesthetic force. The vision we conjure from the experience can serve as an indispensable way out of intractable paths. Shortly after my grandfather died, when I was in college, I went back to the house where he lived in rural Virginia. The white clapboard structure nearly ready to sink back into the earth. I stood in this pass-through chamber off the dining room where he painted. As I wrote in The Rise, the dining room looked empty, absent the paintings and drawings we'd often splay out on the table, as if nourishment of an essential kind. I'm mindful of my very personal commitment now to the artists and writers and playwrights and filmmakers whose work I deal with in my scholarship and will teach in my courses, who like my grandfather see this inextricable nexus between art and citizenship and vision and justice. So I dedicate this talk to my grandfather's memory and to all those who are working tirelessly to honor the full spectrum of human life 
through the arts. Thank you. Happy to take questions, um, if if there are any, or if I've stunned you into confused silence, too, that's fine too. <laughs> um, I'm somebody who directs plays, and so a couple of your thoughts made me think about things. One is, how do you reconcile the two opposing thoughts you have about whether they're the, the importance of images? Mm -hmm but are there too many? Right. And then the second is that we here in academic communities, like this one, mm -hmm. tend to support our own sort of political and cultural vision over and over again, because that's what we believe. And whether it's intentional or not intentional, we do it. So as you were talking, I thought, well, maybe we should do a play that's a right-wing play. You know, maybe we should do something that's completely different yeah, yeah. just to provoke conversation. Sure. Anyway, so those sure. are my two questions. How do you reconcile, or do you reconcile those two things? And what do you do about people like us who want to do the same thing over and over again? <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm glad that the, the talk um, sparked ideas, and thank you for the two good questions. To take them in turn, I'd say, how, Regarding the first, how do we resolve this tension? Well, I'm literally writing a piece right now regarding that. But I think that the answer lies in, at the inverse of the large scale problem I was outlining. What I sort of omitted from the talk points to it. Increasingly, in the last few weeks, we've seen a sort of a spate of visual displays of justice that focus on a single point, you know a plaque at Harvard to honor the four enslaved men and women who served two Harvard presidents, right? A plaque with their names on the house, on the president's house, the former, on Wadsworth House. You have now a new database to look at the memorials of enslaved men and women in the United States, a new database to point out each spot that we can actually identify, right? Brian Stevenson has an initiative that's focusing with the same idea on memorials to honor the lives lost to lynching, right? And I've been thinking through the way in which we're never going to be able to escape, nor should we, the role that stillness and that a single object that can't be virally disseminated has on the technology of the soul, you know, on the ability to stand and be moved and, as Douglas described, let your imagination take you to a place that then ignites a new vision of how life can be, or how it should be. I don't think there's any Skyped experience of seeing the plaque at Harvard of the four enslaved um, men and women that would give you the same chills that it does to stand there and imagine what life was like right, for them. You know? So I, I think the answer lies at the inverse of scale, ultimately. And it means that technology offers us, indeed, fantastic opportunities uh, for reach but we should never forget, and it goes back to Douglas, that the role of the arts is to give us depth, to plumb us down, you know, um, to the very core of who we are, to, sh to shake up that foundation, to see things anew. So that's, that's really my answer now. Perhaps it will evolve. But, um, and to your second question, I, my short answer is absolutely. We should have plays that deal with, perhaps more in your case, right-wing themed uh, issues. In fact, in putting together the vision and justice issue, I should state for the record, I wanted this great image of um, Condoleezza Rice next to Susan Rice, but it was embargoed by Annie Leibovitz and we couldn't do it, but I did try. I was, it wasn't just a democratic endeavor. Let's get back to the image here. So, so there she is with Michelle Obama above her, but I didn't intend to make an entirely democratic enterprise, right? So, so there are ways that I do need to push myself um, I think that book, The Big Sort, you know, by Bill Bishop is fantastic on the, this score. He really points to um, the extremism of our kind of polarization and our need to uh, combat that by doing precisely what you're just describing. Yeah, thank you. And I know we had a lot of other hands, I'm sorry. It's such a good question. I
offered multiple paragraph answers. <laughs> okay, so any other questions? No? Yeah. I was really, thank you, first of all, um, but I was really fascinated by the point you were making about bus, the bystander effect uh, of images, and since many of us in the room do teach, mm -hmm. um, how do you counteract that um, effect yeah. in your classroom, mm -hmm. in your own work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the things I'm very grateful for is to work in a department that's so focused on the object, you know. And certainly, there are ways in which we, we teach about the importance of how to curate a show and looking at the digital platforms that disseminate these objects. But really, having pedagogy that focuses on the object, I think, gets you to see the meaning embedded in material, you know, and also gives you a sense firsthand of the transformative power of the experience of interaction with it. So to the degree to which pedagogy focuses on the object, working in, say, a study center in a museum, uh, as opposed to simply showing the JPEGs of the objects, I think it is really, it's a quite simple answer, but I think it's the way to have the experience become so embodied that then the student cannot imagine it really any other way. It goes back to this, the first question about the opportunity that technology offers, but the tension that it creates. As, as uh, Wynton Marsalis put it in his book, Letters to a Young Artist, you, you can't move past the technology of the soul, right? No matter how we evolve, no matter how many great new apps we have, no matter how much technology progresses, the way we are moved by things will not fully change, uh, to, in our next few generations at least. I, I write about, about that too, the sense of um, really what a lot of this talk is about is the way in which wonder you know, an astonishment uh, occurs within the body to get us to see things differently. How wonder and astonishment works with technology and being awash with images is something we're still figuring out, you know. Um, my mind is sort of reeling with different studies about that. But the disconnect between the way in which it works for me is so great that I'd like to privilege the embodied experience in the classroom. You know. Does that answer? Hi, thank you so much for that. Um, I was just thinking, I teach a class of, of, to my undergraduates and graduates, but this semester to my undergraduates, where we really start with Douglas and Jacobs and mm -hmm. some writers, uh, some black writers who are very invested in the visual and, and particularly the photograph. And so we think a lot about Douglas and, and why he was so invested in the photograph. So thank you for bringing that. And so as we were talking this semester, um, the students were saying, a few students said, you know, Douglas feeling that photographing the African-American body was so important because it could not be photographed honestly and authentically right. or not photographed, captured artistically in painting and, mm -hmm. right, car and engravings mm -hmm. um, because artists couldn't see blackness mm -hmm. in, in an honest way. Exactly. Um, so Douglas never smiles in any of his photographs. But my students were saying, well, this is just like the Black Lives Movement matter, mm -hmm. uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wanted to resist the idea that, that we could connect those so closely. And so I love this idea of thinking in your talk as how it is necessary to see the line that comes from Douglas, but also helping our students understand that Douglas's position as a slave is not something that they as college students, who yes, are undergoing different kinds of challenges and injustice, as you point out, but that it's a, it, there's a danger in suggesting that it's the same, that in their mm -hmm. space of sometimes relative privilege in our classrooms, mm -hmm. um, that there's a need to still distinguish. How do you deal with that? Because I find that both mm -hmm. enlivening as a conversation, but also there's something mm -hmm. dangerous about wanting to suggest that the enslaved state, the state mm -hmm. that African Americans existed in at that time, mm -hmm. is somehow similar to what's going on in college campuses today. Yeah, well, thank you for the question. It's, it's a huge one, and hopefully, maybe I'll see you later so we can keep on talking about it. <laughs> so what shall I say publicly now hmm, to answer this huge question? Well, I think we're, we're coping with and 
dealing with something that's in the abstract about having very short historical memory as we, we teach these topics, right? Um, it's what allows people to conflate not even uh, slave periods with what's going on in the current day, but mash together the civil rights movement with the Black Lives Matter movement as if we're dealing, coping with the same systems of injustice or um, structures. So I, I think you're doing great work in making sure that they see the delineated differences across all the different levels in which they occur. But you can't teach the history of photography without dealing with the, these topics that Douglas is outlining. You know, you, you can't, the way, part of the reason, and this was sort of out of the purview of the talk as I saw it for today, but I should just mention now, part of the reason that Douglas was so animated about looking at photography was because of the role of photography for dehumanizing African Americans, right? The, the images that I left out were of the bare-chested and bare-breasted African and American-born Negroes of the time, right, that J.T. Zeely photographed for Louis Agassiz to prove that, to prove polygenesis, you know. And Douglas spoke about that in his 1854 speech on the School of Ethnology. So his whole goal with this Pictures in Progress speech was, as he put it, you know, to to refute what the ethnologists were doing, which was trying to read African Americans out of the human family. He wanted to use photographs to read us back in, right? It's a revolutionary idea, and you can see why he was so determined for 30 years to get it right. Uh, but his own body, his own decision to have this level of self-possession such that he was uh, nearly a statesman at the end of his life was informed through the mechanism of, of photography too. But to equate that with what's going on today, I think, shows us how much work we actually have to do as educators. <laughs> um, and, and that's why I say it's for a larger conversation. In the classroom, I think there are ways to set up uh, a seminar or a syllabus to, to really tease out why those differences are important um, and what's lost with that collapse. You know, so maybe we can, I'd love to hear your tactics for doing that. <laughs> These are great questions. Yes, yes, I'll go back to it. Okay. Mm hmm, mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. No, it's a great question. I wish I could prognosticate the answer, but I, but I do face a similar challenge, and I think the way that I see it, I don't know, might, might be helpful. I think that, and it really goes back to the process of, of writing The Rise. Um, initially, I mean, I, I'm relatively young. I started a lot of my research online and then realized I was dealing with an eternal idea about the role of failure and improbable foundations for iconic creative lives. Meaning I could go back all the way to Aristotle if I wanted with this idea. I didn't just have to search the web for things that Google had scanned maybe in the last couple of years. And I, so many of the pearls of wisdom came from being in the stacks, being with weathered text, being with you know, books that hadn't been checked out in decades, and stumbling on treasure really. And th that experience shifted how I thought about um, my resources. And I mentioned that to say, I, I think it's understandable for a person who hasn't had the experience of finding treasure off of their iPad, you know, to not look at a book with the sense of wonder that we know it contains. So I think our goal in part is, 
as educators is to be effective curators for them, you know, to find those objects that might ignite that sense of wonder, right? The way that many of us in the room have experienced our sense of wonder with not just books as objects, but works of art as objects. Uh, as a young person, I remember going to the Met, looking at works, I mean, from sort of ancient Egypt, and looking at a fingerprint on an object and thinking, my God, there was a, this is what connects me back to centuries. I, I wouldn't be as moved if it was on a screen. But anyway, so that's an experience I had that a teacher gave me. How can we create that for our students, I think, is our work. So I see it as more of an opportunity than a challenge. Um, and we're fortunate, I mean, at Harvard here at the University of Idaho, have such great resources to be able to do that for them. So uh, I'm not, I'm going to remain encouraged. <laughs> and I hope you do too, you remain so. Can we take a few more? Do we have time? I deliberately gave a short talk so I could do lots of questions. Oh, oh, wherever the mic is, sorry. Yeah, well, can you raise this hand fast? This is kind of a convoluted way to get to a simple question. Okay. Uh, I, it's been many years since I've been to the Frederick Douglass house. But the picture you have there in black and white, it looks like springtime with flowers. Yeah. But I remember most was how dangerous the neighborhood was and how deteriorated the neighborhood. And obviously the different pictures, if you took a picture of the neighborhood and then seeing that house versus just seeing the house in black and white would yeah. give you much different impressions. How do we separate art from propaganda? Mm, mm. Well, how long do you have? <laughs> yeah. Mm. I don't know that that question is, is, answered, is answered as easily through Douglas's sort of material culture, or the culture surrounding his life. But I will say, when, when the book came out, and I have to say, it's such a, thank you, Chris, for the invitation to come and speak about creativity more broadly, because it's such a, an honor to be able to speak about this particular chapter, you know, on beauty and error and justice, instead of the whole synoptic talk about failure. It's really a pleasure. But the, the, the role of propaganda came up so much um, whenever I would speak about this. In part, I think, because it's effective. Propaganda is negatively effective. And we've focused in, in history far more on the times in which propaganda has swayed people in a negative direction. And consequently, we haven't looked at the role of some of these catalytic moments that I've tried to highlight here today. I mean, how many people know that one of the leaders for the movement against segregation was inspired by Louis Armstrong, right? To understand the beauty coming out of his horn as genius, such that he could see the world differently. It's not meant to be propaganda. That's meant to remind us of just the organic power of the arts, to get us to see past the kind of hardened perspective we have from our rational thoughts sometimes, you know, to open us up to see the world differently. I don't know what the like antonym is to propaganda, meaning I don't know what, if there is a word for art that can transform in that way, but that's what I'm after. You know, that's really, I think, what the, the substance of the talk is about, to remind us that there's an, there is an offsetting power to, I think your question is really about the kind of negative propaganda in the world, and this is largely part of the reason why creativity matters. It's not just for our, our own lives, but it's, it's instructive for um, the collective change in society that points us in the direction towards, um, I think, a righteous embrace of the full dignity of human life. Yeah. More questions or conversation? Or I'm so glad you asked that question. It's so important, and, and Chris and Leslie, it goes back to a conversation earlier we had during the day about the, the function of critique. Uh, I should first say, I, 
I think in a spate of, say, 10 years, if you're a current student, I'm, I'm a young professor, I think the main shift that's occurred is that the online culture lets people hide behind their screens such that they're more willing to sort of speak negatively about works that go out into the world, right? Yes? Amen, course, yes. <laughs> this is, and so you have these um, vocal cowards, you know, I would say, right? that can really stifle, um, maim, you know, and hurt those who are doing wonderful work in the world. So what do you do in the face of that? Well, and this goes back to our earlier conversation, I think one of the things I learned at Yale School of Art and as a curator at MoMA and at Tate is to make sure, one of the things I learned was that the creative process requires that you discern when your work is ready for critique and when it needs to be safe havened, you know. Now, that's, that's part of, I think, what any creative individual needs to deal with when they're creating a work. And I write about this in, in different chapters of the book, but it's urgent for the kind of question you're asking because it means, because it relates to what happens even when the process is done and it's out in the world. You still have to have that same level of discernment, you know to know when you want to engage with those vocal cowards online <laughs> and, and when you just need to, as, what does Beyonce say? Don't look at the comments. That's what she says. Don't look to not look at the comments <laughs> on whatever is posted about you or, or whatnot. I do think it's important to have a, a healthy sense of, of self-protection um, in this age we're living in. I... Uh, there's so much to say about this topic. I hope we might be able to talk a little bit more afterwards. Um, but I hope in part that, that helps that answer about needing to toggle back and forth between protection and putting your work out into the world in part helps. Because you can't, because you, if you're expecting me to say you have to somehow shift your level of creativity or what you're putting out into the world to acquiesce to those cowards, you could never do that, right? So the answer is just how to protect yourself, essentially, you know? Okay. Oh, who's it going to be? I'm not going to pick. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> you continue with uh, protecting your creative process. Um, I'm thinking about uh, how, does, how do you protect your creative process as an artist, as, as an artist citizen, and or dealing with the obligation or responsibility of the artist citizen? Um, I'm thinking about Louis Armstrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, when he performed, he didn't set out to uh, you know, inspire change in, mm -hmm. uh, in that person, but mm -hmm. just his work did it. But as an artist, especially as a black American artist, uh, collectors or you know, viewers want to see a certain thing from you. And they want your opinion about the latest topic. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you just want to uh, create a painting because you want to create a painting. Mm -hmm. And so how do, how do you? protect your creative process from stereotypes or expectations. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, this really is a how long do you have um, <laughs> question. <laughs> okay, and it's a fantastic, crucial question. Um, I mean, the first thing I would say is that you can't communicate without authenticity, period, you know. Any thinker I've described, I mean, Louis Armstrong, let's just put his image back up because he's so warm. Uh, and this gives you that feeling of what we're describing here. You can't communicate without that light, without that authenticity, you know. Plumbing down to that point, I think, is our first endeavor as, as any artist, right? To get to that point within yourself so that you can communicate what that is. There are trends, there are fads, there are ways that in the art world uh, kind of following a certain expectation for what will, will sell your work or what you need to respond to as a black artist, you know, can be a pressure that you can, you can succumb to. But if it in any way compromises, you're looking like this, you're feeling like this, that kind of authenticity and joy, then it's the wrong answer, you know. <laughs> there are some artists, I can name a few, who happen to have this kind of beautiful intersection between their work being authentic and on assignment and still meeting the interest of collectors who want to deal with the kind of black art in an essentialist way. Uh, but if that's not your nexus, then you can't go there just for the sake of the market. You have to honor what it is that you do. And any 
And I love that term, you know, citizen artist, which lots of organizations are really focusing on now. I think any citizen artist at root is someone who is seeking to affirm the humanity of others through an expression of their own authentic human passion, you know. And once they get to that place, then they're able to be effective um, leaders and artists who can inspire, but not when they're sort of kowtowing to a certain agenda, not when they're, I, I just don't think historically that not just works, I don't think that has efficacy, but I don't think that has endurance, you know, or, and can sustain a career. So, you're making me want to go back to being curator or, or <laughs> critic at Yale School of Art. Um, this has been wonderful, meaningful for me, um, and I hope has been somehow nourishing for you. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you.